So for the last session of this morning before lunch, uh, I think we're very lucky to have uh, Chuck Allison from uh, Utah, Utah Valley, Valley University, uh, who's going to share with us some of the stories of teaching D at university, um, maybe give us some of the uh, extra answers to the question we asked earlier about you know, how people, how newcomers to the language find it and how they get started. Um, but without preempting what we're going to hear, um, I'm going to get off the stage and uh, introduce without further ado, Chuck, take it Thank away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi. Well, I, I suppose this will be the comic relief before lunch um, after the advanced stuff that we saw. But uh, I have been teaching um, D for eight years at Utah Valley University. The reason I've done that is I've known Walter for over 20 years. I met him, I believe, in 1991 at C++ World and still remember the talk he gave. Uh, very impressed with how practical and level-headed he was. And I was there when he gave his first D talk um, at Software Development Conference. And I wish he was here. I could ask him when exactly that was. But uh, I'm thinking it was 1999 or 2000. I can't remember. Um, so I, I've known him for a long time. and. Uh, of course, I was impressed uh, with the language, uh, but I didn't really start using it uh, until about 10 years ago. And then, of course, I got really excited about it with uh, 2.0. So I'm going to get to tell you why uh, I ended up teaching a class on it. Uh, but first, just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science at Utah Valley University in Orem, Utah. It's uh, near BYU in Provo. Some of you might have heard of Brigham Young University. Um, and so I've been there 13 years, and, um, and so maybe I can tell you what would happen to you if you leave development for 13 years. I I'm different than I used to be. Uh, I, I used to be like you, <laughs> which is a good thing to be. I, I just loved being a developer. And of course, I still develop code, but I'm not in the, in the trenches with you know, the, the workaday stuff like you are. So I have a little different perspective, but I did have 20 years. Uh, as a software engineer. Uh, but I started in Fortran. <laughs> so, you know, it's been a while. My degrees are all in mathematics. I have three degrees in mathematics. And so I worked for defense contractors for a while and did a lot of scientific programming. And then I got into C in 1983 and C++ in 1989. I actually wrote some of the documentation for the Borland C++ way back when. And I was an early adopter of Walter's Zortex C++, the first compiler for DOS for C++. So those were, those were fun days. I joined the uh, C++ Standards Committee in uh, 1991, uh, first technical meeting, and I was, spent 10 years on that committee. I uh, contributed uh, part of the library, and I've written a couple of books on C++, one with Bruce Eckel, Thinking in C++ Volume 2. The earlier book was based on my uh, columns in the C, C and C++ Users Journal. I was the last senior editor for that. And then it was subsumed by Dr. Dobbs, and then the rest is history. Um, so just out of curiosity, uh, do we have any former C and C++ Users Journal readers in this audience? We have a couple. Oh, hey, look at that. Great. Good. Yeah, that, that used to be a yes. Thinking in, did I, did I do it wrong? Oh, it's, it's up there. That's a typo, but I won't fix it right now. Thank you. Yeah, and you can actually get that for free online. You know, you can just uh, Google for it, and, and, and there's an HTML version. But it's a little dated, and I'm actually thinking of updating it, but I'm, hard, I'm having a hard time getting excited about it. <laughs> Don't tell anybody I said that. This isn't broadcast right now. <laughs> So anyway, I've been a D enthusiast uh, from the very beginning. But I want you to know, as we go through this, as a professor, I teach so many different things. I teach eight or nine different classes, not all at once, of course. I teach computation theory. I teach C++ and Python and uh, all kinds of things. And I haven't done any D since December, so uh, let's, uh, when I last taught it. So let's hope that uh, my brain will engage. Anyway, just a quick word about Utah Valley University. Um, I know you probably have never heard of it, but we do have over 30,000 students, uh, more than any other university in Utah. Um, we ha are, however, uh, an open enrollment school. We started as 
a trade, uh, a technical trade school in World War II. And uh, it has just grown and grown, and now it's a bona fide university, but it, ha it has kept some of its roots. And so we have some pressures that not a lot of institutions have. Um, we still have a lot of uh, two-year programs and trade programs, but we have bachelor's and master's degree, master's degree. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, uh, I'm gonna give you some pretty unfortunate statistics here. We have a thousand majors in the computer science department, and in a moment you'll find out how many we only graduate per year, only 40. Um, and I know that sounds terrible, um, uh, but what can I say? We actually have a, a very rigorous program. Now, are we as hard as MIT? No. Um, but are we better than what you might think? And the answer is yes, and I have some proof uh, for that for you coming up. But let me just tell you that in our department, uh, we have three degrees, computer science, and that degree is ABET accredited and has been for over a decade. So it's a, it's a very uh, quali high quality degree. We have two emphases, a CS emphasis and then the uh, net centric computing. Um, that's where they do networking and web development and stuff like that. We also have a separate degree in software engineering and one in computer engineering. And as I said, a thousand majors but only 40 graduate per year. But let me tell you about one of those graduates, Rafael Lima from Brazil. He graduated last year. He got hired by Amazon at six figures right out of school. $37,000 signing bonus and stock options. And he recently sent this to me. It's been about six weeks. And I want to read this. I now work at Amazon.com among some of the best developers in the world. I'm amazed that I'm able to work here when only four years ago I knew nothing about developing, not even what a for loop was. I think he came from accounting, which, you know, well, we don't want to say anything bad about another profession. When I tell people about classes I took at UVU, people are amazed at the level and depth of the classes at an undergraduate level. Projects like creating a compiler, assembler, and virtual machine, or using genetic algorithms to create a number recognition app. Even students that went to more well-known schools don't have such a background. In my group alone, there are other recent graduates at the same level as me that have master's degrees from places such as Carnegie Mellon, University of Washington and other ranked schools. With the teaching I received at UVU, I don't feel at all like I had inferior training. I am on par with these coworkers. Well, let me just tell you about the senior year, and this is the context for my teaching D. In their senior year, our students in the CS emphasis in the fall have to take the first three classes you see here, an advanced high performance architecture class where they write their own virtual machine with an embedded assembler, and then they take my class where I teach D, among other things, the analysis of programming languages. And those two classes are the prerequisite for the compiler st construction class that they have in the spring, where they actually implement a compiler. And it's a, it's a sizable language, functions, classes, objects. Um, and the virtual machine is multi-threaded. And then, of course, the, they have to take artificial intelligence, too. So the fall semester of their senior year is really quite difficult. Am I bringing back bad memories from your years at school? <laughs> no, good, you have good memories of being at school, right? OK, well, good. I'm glad to hear it. Um, and so they actually do have to implement a compiler. Uh, and by the way, Walter sent out an email to all of the speakers saying, you might want to put pictures on your slides. It always makes things more interesting. So I, again, I'm sorry Walter's not here to see this, but this is for Walter. Almost every slide has a picture, except, <laughs> except for the slides that have code. OK, well, let me tell you about this course that I teach. It's a programming languages course. It's at the senior level. Um, and so this is where we get into the depth of different paradigms and, and, and imp language implement design and implementation issues. And what I do in this course is I immerse the students in functional programming. Uh, they don't really get a lot of exposure to that uh, in our program, and so they get it here. And I use ML, the pure functional subset of ML. Uh, I think it's a, a beautiful, simple language, and, and since it's statically typed, it, uh, it's an opportunity to talk about type systems. And so we talk a lot about type theory and, and, and everything that you can think of uh, that has to do with functional programming. 
I mentioned explicit lazy evaluation because ML is a strict language and it doesn't have lazy evaluations, so I make them, I make them write their own thunks so that they can actually simulate um, lazy evaluation like uh, is done in Haskell and in D. And then uh, I have some assignments using infinite streams uh, like is done in Scheme with Abelson and Sussman at M MIT. Of course, I don't know if you've heard, but a lot of these schools are switching to Python as their first, first language. You've probably heard that, right? My, a, lot, a lot of times students will ask me, what am I, what's my favorite language? I just ended up teaching C++ this semester a couple of weeks ago, and it's an advanced C++ class. And so they say, what's your favorite language? And I always answer, it's always Python and D. And those are my favorite languages. I can't yet separate them, and that is I can't yet not use Python. D's not there yet, in my opinion, but I think we're getting there. So those are the two languages that I like to use. But I finished the course teaching D, and some of the students have gone on, uh, they've been so excited about it that in their second semester, they'll write their compiler in D. Quite a number of students have done that. And some students have actually taken my class a year early, and they'll even write their virtual machine in D as well as their compiler in the second semester. So, how do I introduce D? And there's the picture for Walter there at the top. Um, well, um, our main text is uh, Ali's uh, online D tutorial, so thank you for that. Uh, we used to use Andre's book, and uh, he's not here for me to apologize to, but um, it's a little out of date. It's a print book, and so what can I tell you? So it's, it's just a reference, but we use Ali's uh, online tutorial, which of course is, is always up to date. And, uh, and getting better all the time. So uh, here is how I introduce D. This is an actual slide from my presentation, uh, except I don't use pictures. Maybe I should. So I'll start putting more pictures in my code, or in my, in my slides. So the students that I teach, um, they have a background in, in C Sharp and C++. And probably JavaScript and, and you know a few other languages like that. And so I'll just start by telling them, well, D is like C++ in the sense that it supports things like static locals. Uh, of course, the raw pointers are there uh, if you need them. We do not need them for anything we do in this course, but they're there. Uh, it has templates, and of course, the template facility, in my opinion, and perhaps you would share this opinion as well, is more flexible and powerful than it is in C++. I was there on the standards committee when templates were introduced. Um, and, and actually, uh, my contribution to the C++ library uh, required a, a, a change in, in ah, too late. I've already talked about both of you. You missed it. And, 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 I, did, and I mentioned to everybody, Walter, that I got a picture on almost every slide because you asked for pictures. So there you go. OK. So uh, anyway, um, and of course, it, it compiles to native code. This is the wonderful thing about it, and it, it, it's just great. Has operator overloading like C++ does, and hey, it's got an exponentiation operator. The next thing I tell them is D is also kind of like uh, Java and C Sharp. Uh, you know, it, it supports objects. Uh, it has the mother of all classes object. Um, it has uh, explicit user-defined interfaces. Uh, the inheritance model looks similar to C Sharp. It has inner classes. It has delegates, only they're better, in my opinion, a little more flexible. And here's my picture of delegates. So, you know, I thought that was nice. Uh, and of course, it distinguishes between reference and value types like C Sharp does, and it supports properties. So, this will put some people at ease uh, that know Java and C Sharp. But for me, it's kind of like Python and some, other, and some functional programming languages as well. Uh, it's module and package facility. Uh, looks a lot like Python's to me. Very powerful and flexible and easy to use. Uh, being, uh, since it has uh, support for functional programming, which I stress so much in this course, it supports nested functions, enclosures, lambda expressions. Um, and in, there's a pure functional programming subset, and this is my bridge from ML to D in this class. So, you know, for two months they've done ML, uh, and, and in, in the meantime, you know, we have to talk about other things as well, about type systems and 
polymorphism, the different types of polymorphism, and scope issues, dynamic scoping versus static scoping. And so it's a, a true programming languages course where we intermix programming assignments in the different languages. And uh, so functional programming is just second nature to them by the time uh, we get to D. And so their first assignment in D is to actually do some functional programming. Um, and so I have them use, you know, uh, reduce and map and filter and things like that. I don't know if uh, I saw somebody laughing. Maybe you were reading this little thing here. It's kind of cute, right? Functional programming. I'm not la lazy. I just act by need. So for those of you that know what pass by need is, but if you don't, well, then I guess that's not funny. Okay, well, here's a joke. Let's see if you get this. How many people are, consider themselves semi-mathematicians? Okay, why did the mathematician name his dog Koshi? Because he left a residue at every pole. Okay, that went over well. <laughs> Wrong audience. <laughs> okay, so, um, I, and of course, um, the thing that's uh, nice uh, about D is that D is for real programmers. So, you know, this is a language, this is a course where we talk about the theory of languages and we, and we use these languages to do new and different things. But at the same time, I let them know that this is very practical. There is built-in support for unit testing, contract programming, uh, and the keyword safe, trusted, and system. And like anything else, uh, it's, it's for workaday programming, debug versus release builds. And I happen to be a big fan of scope, exit, success, and failure. Uh, again, I remember the days when Andre, Andre came up with ScopeGuard in C++ way back when. And, uh, and so what he did, obviously, is he, he just took what he did years ago in C++ and gave a, a great new keyword, and, uh, and so now we have Scope. Now that's, the other uses of Scope I'm not so sure about, but uh, Scope, Exit, Success, and Failure, I'm, I'm pretty happy with those. And then um, we also talk about the fact that D has great support for concurrent programming, not just in the typical way with, with locks and mutexes, but also uh, the message passing paradigm. And they actually have an assignment, and I'm going to show that to you, that uses message passing. And of course, it can interoperate with C and C++. So what do we cover in this course? Well, I try to cover everything in the language. Uh, I know that's... Uh, ambitious, but let me tell you, we only have a month. And so we have eight to nine class periods of 75 minutes. And so we're talking about uh, 10 hours or so to cover D. And in the meantime, they still have to do other assignments related to the concepts of programming languages that we're covering. So uh, it, it, we can only do so much, but as you can see, we cover quite a bit. Uh, and again, this is for Walter. There's slices in the top, and, and here's a lazy evaluation right here. And, and there's scope and threads and message passing, so, all right. <laughs> but, um, um, but, you know, we, we cover, uh, you know, a very important part of a course like this is the different ways of passing parameters. And so we talk about in, out, ref, lazy, const, immutable, and all that stuff. Uh, but naturally, we spend a lot of time on the uh, functional programming things. Um, templates, of course, uh, and they have an assignment where they use alias parameters to stimulate pass by need. We do a compile time function evaluation, universal function call syntax. And they actually have an assignment using uh, nullable, which I'll show you, which is a kind of a nice thing. And then their last assignment is a concurrent programming assignment. So here's the first assignment. So this is kind of bring back some memories for you. If you had a class like this, um, for some of you, it's been more years than others. And uh, for me, of course, they didn't have classes like this when I was in college. Um, and, and so here's a very typical first assignment uh, with uh, functional programming. I, I have a list. Of course, it's just an array in D. And so let's write a, a one-liner, a pure function with a single statement that will add a number to everything in the list. And so this ink list thing on the first, uh, second line there will add one to everything on the list. The next one will square each element and return a new list. And these are all pure functions, and so um, they just return new values. 
uh, using the functional programming paradigm. So square sum, give me all the evens, Boolean, exclusive or. Dupe list and compose are kind of interesting. Um, these are generic, and so whatever list you've got, then it'll just duplicate every element. Here's one of my favorites. Let's do a compose an arbitrary number of functions. And so here we're going to be using the compile time parameter list. And so I'm going to give it, uh, in this case, three different functions. And so it, here they're lambda expressions. <clears throat> so the composition of this will take its argument and add one, and then it'll square it, and then it'll divide it by three. So take three and square it, divide it by three. Nine divided by three is three. So this is just their first get used to D programming assignment while they're in the functional programming paradigm. And here are some one-line answers, one-statement <coughs> answers. Now, I want to take the opportunity here to tell you that one of the reasons I'm here, it's not just because Andre and Walter thought this might be a good idea, and I hope it is, but I want to learn from you. I am looking for two things. Number one is, uh, can I do better code in D? And I'm sure I can. Number two is, I'm looking for more ideas for programming assignments. Now, they can't be too big because a, a class like this, we, we have a lot of homework assignments. And, and so we have to do little things. So they can't be more than a couple hundred lines. So if you have any ideas, um, you know, uh, let, let me know. Uh, my, my email is on the beginning of the presentation. And, and you can Google for me and find me easily. But uh, I'm always looking for some good ideas for programming assignments. But nonetheless, here's a, a nice, easy beginning one. So notice how we're using uh, reduce, um, let's see, filter, map, uh, just the, the usual kind of things. Uh, let's take a look, though, at dupe list and compose in the last two. As I said, these are generic, and so uh, dupe list will take a list of any kind, uh, array of any kind. And uh, I, I just love reduce. I mean. I love functional programming, and so uh, does anybody ever use reduce? Raise your hand if you ever do. Not okay. About half of the people. Um, well, you know, being a mathematician, what can I tell you? Uh, functional programming is second nature to me. So um, it's nice to be able just to, to just to have this combination function to pass to reduce. So every time it gets a new element, it's just going to double it and tack it on the end of what, if it's, what it's accumulated so far, and we just start with an empty list. And so this mimics very much what the students have done in ML. Now, I want to make a comment about the compose function uh, because here's my comment right here. Um, notice how I'm using reverse here. It's std algorithm reverse returns void, right? and dot reverse property does not. And so um, I don't want to have to change this solution. I love the way it works. It's a single statement. So what I want to do is I want to take all of the functions that have been passed to me, and I want to compose them. So therefore, I have to reverse the order of the array so it goes inside out for function composition. But I want to just have it here in place as well. And of course, um, every time it goes through the next function, it's just going to apply the function to whatever has been computed so far. Not the best choice of words, but you may want to try retro. Retro? Yes. OK. It doesn't go back in time. It just does what reverse the No, 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 no. Basically. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. And so the functionality is there. I just didn't know about it. So all right, thank you. That's, that's why we're here. At least that's why I'm here. Well, thank you very much. Then uh, I can delete this box then. OK, good. Well, you've already uh, accomplished one of my goals. OK, homework two, again, just to kind of get them used to using different features in the language. I have them implement a simple deck. And the way that I'll have them do it is using two arrays. You're all familiar with the deck. It's something where you can quickly add on the left and on the right. Uh, without re reshuffling the array until you run out of room. And so the concept is to you know, kind of put things into the middle of an array. But it's easier to just use two arrays. And so we have the front array, which holds everything backwards. 
and then the back array holds everything in the normal order. And then I also have them rebalance it whenever it hits uh, a boundary. It's a very short assignment. It's, it's not that hard. I give them a C++-like interface because they're already familiar with that, and so they just implement these functions. And everything except for the rebalancing, which is not here, of course, is a one-liner in D. So it's, it's pretty good. And I give them a unit test. And so this is homework two. Gets them kind of used to uh, defining a struct and uh, just getting used to using D for non-functional programming purposes. Now this one's a little different. Um, when we go over uh, ML, um, I have them create a s silly little data structure called a semi-map. I made it up. Um, I, I don't know how useful this is, but the idea, and perhaps you don't know ML, but that first line data type up there says that uh, there are two uh, template parameters, A, which is a equality type, and B is any type. And a semi-pair is either a pair or it is just a singleton. And so in other words, this is like a map. It's like an associative array. It's just sometimes the key doesn't have a value. That's all. And so, and yet we want a strictly typed language. Uh, you know, we have a strictly typed language, and so we want each element to only have either a pair of the two types or just a key only. And so they have already implemented this in ML. And so now I just have them do this in D. Let's, let's use D and do the same thing. And it's so easy in D. All we have to do is an associative array where the key is the key, <laughs> the key type, and the value is a nullable. And so it's either there or it's not, and it's easy to find out. And so it makes short work of it. And it's a, a lot more fun and easier than it was in ML, even though ML is fun. OK, um, the last homework is using the idea of an infinite list. And this isn't Haskell, and so we don't have built-in support for that. Um, and of course, there are a number of ways of doing this in D. You could write your own type and implement the range interface. But what I have them do is to kind of mimic what they did in ML. And the idea there is that uh, we'll have this notion of a stream, which will always just give you the next one. It's just like an infinite iterator. And so I have some uh, functions that uh, I have written that just do some basic stream operations. And I have them write the equivalent of reduce for infinite streams. And I, I've called that fold stream because uh, the name in ML and Haskell um, is fold uh, instead of reduce. And that's what they're used to. And this is their opportunity to use uh, pass by name with alias template parameters. Um, and so let me show you um, um, some things that are implemented this way. So to do streams, we do it two ways. One is with message passing and threads, and then the other way is with fibers. And so that's what I'm going to show you now. So here's an example of a function which implements a stream in its own thread, as you'll see. Trinum stream, it, uh, it does all the triangular numbers. 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, you know what those numbers are. And so um, it has a, an infinite loop until it gets terminated. And basically, it just gives you back uh, uh, the, it'll give you 1 the first time. And then the next time, it'll give you 3. And the next time, it'll give you 6. And so this is just a simple example of doing streams but we're going to use threads to do it because it's so easy to do it. The message passing allows us to make a request and get the thing back. So the, what I've done here is the calling thread will ping this thread. And so that's, uh, it sends its thread ID. And then uh, this thread then will respond back by sending to that thread uh, whatever the current value is. And then, of course, it'll terminate when it's done. Here's an example of using it. So again, remember, this is like reduce. Um, fold stream is like reduce. What it does is it takes, for compile time template parameters, a function 
which is its combination or accumulation function that takes two arguments. Whatever has been accumulated so far, which in the beginning is the initial value, and then the current value from the stream. So those are the compile time uh, parameters for that. So in this case, um, I'm going to be summing up the triangular numbers, as you can see by the definition of the function f. I just create the sum of each element as it's encountered. And so I spawn the trinum stream, and now it's in its loop waiting to receive. And then I will spawn fold stream. We haven't seen this yet, and this is, the students need to write this. So I will instantiate it with the function, and that's the pass by name using alias. And then the type that we're working on in these streams is ints. Um, and then it takes two parameters, of course, um, the thread ID um, that called it, and then the uh, stream that it's going to be requesting values from. And then the initial value for the sum is 0. And so I'll just go through and uh, get the uh, sum of the first 10 triangular numbers, and it's easy enough to do. I'll just send a request to that thread, and then it will send back to me, and I'll receive the answer. And so there's the sum of 1, 3, 6, 10, et cetera. Any questions? We doing OK? This is probably easy stuff for most people. Let's look at another stream. This one takes uh, numbers, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, the integers, positive integers in turn, but returns them as a string. Because again, I want them to do this uh, as a generic function. I want these streams to be, you know, fold stream to be generic. And so I want to test it with things other than numbers. And so here, when uh, this stream gets a request, it'll just send back the next number, but as a string. And then to use that, I will spawn that num stream, and this time the type is string. And what my function is going to do this time, my combinating, uh, com combination function, it's going to concatenate an underscore and the number it gets from num stream. And so the output that we would expect for 10 times would be this. So it just keeps concatenating it. So how do we write fold stream? Oh, this is a good exercise. Um, it's, it's simple, but you can imagine that these students have all these things swimming in their head, and we just finished one language, and we're talking about all of these concepts and activation records and garbage collection and, and all that implementation of those uh, garbage collection uh, algorithms. And, and now I throw this at them. And so um, FoldStream takes uh, as an alias parameter the combining function, the function that um, you're going to be uh, accumulating the next value in the list with, and the type of that value. And then as runtime parameters, the thread that is its caller, so it knows how to pass the result back to um, the thread. And then the stream that it's going to be calling to get the next value from. And so uh, we have a potentially infinite loop here that just uh, waits um, <clears throat> to be pinged. And so the main function, of course, is calling fold stream. And so it's going to send a request to the worker stream that it's getting the next value from that it's processing. And then it's going to process it by the call to f. And then send that back to the caller. So that's the end of that. Now, you're probably wondering, why did we have to use threads for that? We didn't have to use threads for that because things aren't really parallel, right? Uh, there was some concurrency there, but it was really serial. Well, the reason I do that is just to get them used to threads and the message passing interface because that's a very wonderful way of doing concurrency. But that's not really the best way to solve this particular problem. And this is going to lead us to another request that I have, but then after Andre's talk this morning, I'm, I'm very reluctant to make any requests because I may have to do it myself. <laughs> and I don't know if I'm ready to volunteer to be a lieutenant. 
So anyway, so let's, let's redo this with fibers. And there's the pictures for Walter. So I'm going to bring up um, a, an implementation uh, for this very same problem with fibers. And yet, um, you'll see, uh, let me just tell you that it's considerably longer than the simple example um, uh, that we did with message passing. And the reason is because we have to use the class interface for fibers. Because fiber.yield does not return anything. Um, and so this is my request, or my hope. Uh, for those of you that know Python, it's, we're talking about generators here, really. Coroutines and generators is what we're talking about. And so it, it would be a lot easier to write this if yield would return something. But instead, I have got to now create my own fiber class. And then, um, uh, that, and then in, for each of the concrete streams that I want to do, uh, I have to inherit, inherit from this uh, common abstract class that has in it everything I need to do for my streams. So uh, here's the abstract class uh, that represents a stream. And uh, the, the run method is what's going to have the infinite loop like we've seen before, where we're going to be yielding the next value to the caller. So uh, as always, I have, to have, uh, I have to pass on to the superclass, to the fiber class, what the run method is. But of course, I don't know what it is. It's going to be overridden. And so um, it's an abstract method. And I'm going to need to be able to get from each stream what its current value is. And then I'm going to eventually want to stop it as well. And uh, <clears throat> so what I'm doing here, here's a concrete stream now that inherits from the abstract class. What the run method does, after whatever it needs to do locally, uh, it's just going to call done here. And uh, I'm finally to the point where I don't write paren paren after that now. Is that, is that good practice? Is that what D people do when they call no arg functions? Or do you guys always put the parens in there? Let's take a poll. How many do it the way I do it without parens when it's a, single, a no arg function? We're in the minority. You're only halfway there? You're not sure? OK, fine. Well, again, I'm a mathematician. And so by training, I'm taught to be lazy. That's, <laughs> that's what mathematicians are taught to do. They're taught to just, um, so I had to overcome this when I was a developer, by the way. It was, really, it was very difficult. But mathematicians are taught to say, yeah, it can be done, and, but they don't do it. And so I was taught that way. So um, I like to do as few key presses as possi possible. Anyway, so I prime it with the first value, and I'll yield right away. And so the, uh, the caller, uh, if you will, gets that. How many have used fibers? Can I see a raise of hands? OK. And, and then, of course, compute the next value for the next time around so it can be yielded. So there's just a quick example of how to do that with streams. Um, let me go down and uh, show the rest. All right, so here's the trinum stream. Um, um, the first value is 1. And uh, oh, notice I didn't, I didn't, let me go back. I didn't show you that. Uh, look on line 6 there. Um, the abstract class actually holds a, a variable for the, va the current value. And so um, I initialize that value on line 38 to 1. And then in the case of the, the trinum stream, I'm going to add the next difference, which is always one bigger than the previous difference. And then here's num stream. Oh, actually, that's, that's a different one. You can ignore that. Here's string stream. So this does the same thing as um, uh, the, the, what the other one did. It, converts the next integer to a string. But I'm actually calling another stream here. I'm calling a num stream that I had before. And so that is the, um, a fiber that I'm going to uh, implement that, that I'm going to instantiate this with. And so I'll just call on that and then convert it to a stream. In any case, here's fold stream. Here's reduce, if you will, for streams. Longer. 
of course, and more, more lines of code because I'm inheriting and I'm overwriting and I have a constructor and I've got to store things. So it's more code than I had before. Nonetheless, um, in this case, I have a separate variable result that's doing the accumulation. And so I'm going to call the fiber that I'm getting the value from. And of course, that's passed in the constructor, the stream fiber that I'm, that I'm calling from. And so I'll call that. And so, and now I will use the uh, combining function that was passed, the binary function, and I'll accumulate it. That's my new result. I'll yield that, and I'll just keep doing that. So I call, I get the next element from the client stream, and then I return, or I yield, the um, updated accumulated value. So that looks a little different in the main. Uh, here's the same two functions I had before, though. Uh, F, where I'm just adding things together, and G, where I'm concatenating an underscore and then the next numeric string. Um, and uh, the main is quite simple, though. So I just create um, a new, uh, I'll create fold stream, passing it the client stream that I want to get values from to accumulate. And just like in the previous example, uh, I'll start with trinum first and then fold stream. All right, then string stream. And so there's the results. Okay, well, now I just want to end with uh, two statements. Um, I want to uh, talk about the effect this has had on the students. And so I also teach a numerics class. I just finished teaching that this semester. And here's what one student sent me. Um, one of the assignments I had them do in this numerics class is a LUD composition for matrix uh, solutions of systems of equations. And he chose to do it in D. And I, it was kind of funny. I've been wanting to do one of the assignments in D for a while because he took the, ca the class where I, I teach D in the fall. And, and with the D extension, the source file name became LUD, and that just seemed right. LUD is short for LU decomposition. So, um, but he had better reasons for choosing D. I had fun with dynamic arrays and slices. I also got to learn about compact compound format specifiers for printing nested arrays. He, he just figured this out a lot on, on his own. He was our valedictorian, by the way. And then uh, std algorithm reduce, of course, he already knew about this, um, which I used to reduce the input files matrix lines to a dynamic multi-dimensional array. Uh, std range iota for initializing the permutation record array. For those of you that know the LU decomposition, you do partial pivoting on the matrix, and so you have to switch things, and you, re you record the, per the permutations of your swaps. And std range indexed for index into B, that's the right-hand side vector for the system of equations on the permutation record array. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, this person decided to use D in another class. Uh, but this just came in last week. <laughs> I got my evaluations for my teaching, and this is for my C++ class, my advanced C++ class, and I love what this student says. I simply don't have any interest in C++. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I just don't like the syntax. The language feels all patched up to me, and for the general case, it seems like there's a lot more stuff to worry about coding in C++. Duh. So I just don't see the point in fussing with C++ unless I needed something to go really fast or something like that. Now, there's something he doesn't know about D, right? Well, we'll have to educate him on that. I was more impressed with D when you taught it to us in the analysis of programming languages. You sold me on that. Sounds like it does everything C++ does and is cleaner to work with. Why not teach D as the required course and leave C++ as an elective for the C hackers who enjoy that sort of thing? So. So that's, that's late breaking news from last week. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, so the point is that the students do love D and I'm gonna have to take some credit for that because I love it and, and it's infectious and obviously I, I, I sell them on it as that student says. But it really is gratifying to me that they choose to use it outside of class. They'll write their compilers in it, they'll write their virtual machines in it, they'll write LU decomposition in it. Uh, and so it's a lot of fun. Again, if you have any 
um, ideas for improvement for me, and especially ideas for good programming assignments, but that are not too big, a couple hundred lines, then, uh, well, maybe 300 at the most. I'd really appreciate that. There's my email for that. So thank you. Any questions? I would like to thank you for keeping awake uh, in spite of it's right before lunch, so that was well done. Anyway, any questions or any bright ideas? Yes. Do you have any uh, open course program at UVU that would include your uh, courses on D? Okay, we don't have any courses. We don't have any courses that are freely available online, but my materials are all available online for free. Um, you just go to chuckallison.com and click on links. Um, let me just show you real quick. And then you'll, you can get all of my slides that I use for D and, uh, and all of the assignments and, and everything else. So just go to chuckallison.com, click on links my UVU site, and then courses, and it's right here. And here is all of the information. You'll be able to find it under files, and so there's all the slides and all that stuff. But we do not have, we don't do any MOOCs, if you will, although we just got some funding to do one, and, so I, and I'm not involved in it, so we'll see what they come up with. Anything else? All right. Oh, well, we actually had. Thank you. Another question from the. Oh. Last thing before you okay. Um, which, similar to the question we had uh, on the previous uh, talk, I think, which was, um, you know, what were some of the common problems that your students found? I mean, we had the great two quotes at the end there. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what, if there was a student that had had trouble with, uh, sure. What would that most likely have been? The most difficult thing was the alias parameters for templates. Uh, even though they already knew what passed by name was uh, in other languages. Um, uh, it took a while for them to, to get their head uh, around that. Uh, let's see. I, I, don't, I can't think of anything else right now that was hard. Uh, they really picked it up very quickly. A and I think proof of that is, you know, like I say, the last couple of slides there, uh, the way that the students were able to really get into things. But one thing that they loved and they, they got right into right away was slices and, uh, and, and the speed there and the ease of use. I have a lot of examples, you know, well, we do a, a merge sort with slices and it's just super cool, so. And I mean, I know how academia is kind of well, well connected in, in, you know, to other universities and so forth. I mean, do you see other universities wanting to pick up this kind of? I, ha I haven't heard. I, I, I have no idea. I, I've done it just because I've known Walter for over 20 years. And when was your presentation, your first presentation to software development on D? Was it 1999 or 2000? That late, huh? Anyway, I was there. Bruce Eckel and I were sitting in the back with your handwritten slides. Yes, I remember them very well. So. Um, anyway, okay. Um, are there any common traps that the students fall in, in D? Oh, that's a great question. And, and I have to be honest, none come to mind. Uh, but, but remember who these students are. They're seniors. They've had, all have had C sharp and they've had at least two classes in C++ beyond the freshman level, well, one beyond the freshman level. And, and so they're used to, you know, the syntax. Um, it's just the, the biggest overall reaction is a feeling of power. You know, like, wow, this is so much easier and cleaner and, uh, than C++. And so they just like it. What can I tell you? But are you surprised? No, I'm not either. All right. Let's have lunch. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, it's... Um about lunch, but first, I have a comment. Um, I know UVU has great students, um, and they find employment in the industry right after real easy in, in uh, great positions. Um, 
So, you know, maybe a uh, lieutenant would be much for a graduating student, but, you know, we have a bunch of corporal positions and so Oh, open, yes. And so open. Oh. And looking at that deck implementation that you have as an assignment, uh -huh. it would be great to just encourage your students to say, you know what, if that's a great deck implementation you have, how about proposing for a stand library? Deck? Yeah, in general, like, you know, whatever assignment they have, there are always students who take it to the next level. Oh, sure, sure, yeah, I know. Because I was a little surprised it wasn't in the standard library, so I had them write it, and, uh, and then I, I actually use it for another assignment, so. We're, this, we're, uh, we're uh, due for lunch, and I have one small announcement. Um, there are vegetarian options. They are, however, rather limited and kind of, you know, small in size. So please let vegetarians go get there first. They're suffering enough as it is. So <laughs> then you can. All right. Enjoy lunch.